Welcome to the Night Sky in July. The Night Sky is a curated list of deep sky objects, planets, events, things of interest that I think you might enjoy during the month of July in the Northern Hemisphere. So all these measurements will be taken from my latitude in the United Kingdom, which is around the Midlands area, and also off of a full frame camera sensor, but I will have equivalent focal lengths on the left here. So you should be able to find something for your telescope and camera combination. Now with that said, we're gonna start off with deep sky objects because that's what I'm most familiar with and it's how I always start these videos. And we're gonna start wide field at 100 to 200 millimeters. And during summertime, July, really there's only one constellation in the Northern Hemisphere which gets all the attention and that is of course Cygnus. So at 100 to 200 millimeters, I'm going to be recommending a nice wide field shot of the North American Nebula, Pelican Nebula, and you should also get the Seda region in with that as well, like the Seda butterfly and that kind of stuff as well. And if you can do this with narrowband filters as well, such as hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, you should have a really impressive wide field image full of intricate nebulosity. A three to 400 millimeters focal length, well, it's a galaxy. You can probably guess where I'm going with this. It's M31, the Andromeda galaxy. It's on its way back up right now and you can really start adding some data onto this for a nice long project. Now is the time when Andromeda really starts becoming prevalent in the skies again in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't think it's even visible in the Southern. So yeah, now is a really good time to start long projects on Andromeda if that's what you're so interested in doing. Sink a lot of time into it, especially during the course of the year. So 300 to 400 millimeters, I'm going to be recommending the Andromeda Galaxy. At 500 millimeters, I'm going to be recommending that we swing back over to Cygnus because of course, I think I've already qualified this because summertime Cygnus. And we're gonna swing over to the Veil Nebula. So at 500 millimeters, you should be able to get NGC 6960, the West Veil Nebula, question mark, West Veil Nebula, nicely in the frame, as well as Pickering's Triangle, Fleming's Triangular Wisp, whatever you wanna call it, underneath it in one frame. So this should make a nice, to target image again of a supernova remnant. Now these, this remnant has a lot of hydrogen alpha and a lot of oxygen three detail in there. So if you've got dual narrowband filters or narrowband filters in general, you should have a nice fun time with this. That's not to say you can't also add some RGB data to it and make a nice natural star color, like RGB HRO image. So you've got all the fine detail of the nebula of the supernova remnants as well as nice natural star colors. So 500 millimeters, that's what I'd be imaging. At 600 millimeters, I'm gonna recommend that we just move up a little bit from the Veil Nebula, and we're gonna to go to IC5070. So this is the Pelican Nebula. And at 600 millimeters, you can really fill the frame with this nebula. I think a lot of the time it does get a bit overshadowed by the North American Nebula right next to it. But if you orientate this properly, you'll actually see the Pelican in it. And with a nice kind of editing, it can be a really pretty target. So 600 millimeters, I recommend IC5070 to Pelican Nebula. Now my suggestion for 700 to 800 millimeters is more so mid to late July admittedly, but it's actually Messier 33, the Triangulum Galaxy. Now it's very close to the Andromeda Galaxy, it's just down a little bit from it. Uh, and honestly, at a wider field of view, you can actually get both of these galaxies in one frame of one frame. But at 807 to 800 millimeters, I would be recommending that we image the Triangulum Galaxy. Now this is a beautiful front on face on galaxy. It's one of my favorites. Just haven't got a picture to justify it yet. And it's a beautiful faint galaxy. So it's a bit more difficult to target. But one of the best things about it is you can actually add a lot of hydrogen alpha data to this and get some really beautiful pink ready spots of colors on the face of this galaxy from all the nebulous regions within it. So 700 to 800 millimeters, mid to late July. Go give Messier 33 some love. At 1000 millimeters, it's quite a dim, possibly challenging target I'm gonna recommend this month for you. It's SH2157, the Lobster Claw Nebula in the constellation of Cygnus. Now, if you've ever seen any photos of this, you'll completely and immediately understand why it's got this name, the Lobster Claw Nebula. Spoiler alert, it looks like a lobster claw. This is a very faint nebula. I've took wide images of this before and <laughs> it really got a 
tweak the data a bit to get it even to start appearing. So it's quite a dim nebula as far as they go. So it's gonna really utilize some long, in, long exposure times, long integration times, and probably some nice narrowband filters. It is an emission-based nebula. So again, multi-narrowbands, things like that, can be your best friend really, especially if you live within light pollution. So again, it's quite dim, might be a bit of a challenge, but if you've got a 1000 millimeter instrument or any of these on the side here, I do recommend trying SH2157, the Lobster Claw Nebula. At 1,500 millimeters, we're staying within Cepheus, which is one of my personal favorites. And we're gonna go over to the Wizard Nebula. The Wizard Nebula, emission-based nebula, it's one of these that I personally think it wasn't immediately obvious how it should be orientated, but once you've seen it correctly orientated, it's kind of obvious at that point. You kind of kick yourself. Anyway, this is an emission-based nebula, like I said, in the constellation of Cepheus. And with the correct kind of exposure and integration, especially with the Oxygen 3 data, you can make it look like the wizard's really casting some spells and get a really fascinating looking image from it. Especially if you then start playing around with color mapping, for example, you could change the color of a spell, you could change the color of the coat. So have some fun with it, really. Get yourself some narrowband data of it or some color data of it and just have some fun with it. I really wanna see what kind of color palettes and what kind of combinations you get you come up with. So be sure you tag me in those. Now 2000 millimeters, those with the really long focal lengths or any of these ones here, I'm actually gonna be recommending a duo of galaxies in the constellation Canes Venetici, and that is NGC 4631. I am looking this up and NGC 4656. So this is the whale galaxy and the crowbar galaxy, though I'm pretty sure Canadians out there are gonna quickly correct me that the crowbar is actually a hockey stick galaxy. Take your pick. So the whale galaxy and the hockey stick crowbar L-shaped galaxy, take your pick, are, like I said, quite interesting side-on looking galaxies, quite faint, but some really ethereal and wispy colors to them that would really lend themselves to the kind of aperture and detail resolving power that larger instruments have at their disposal. So at 2000 millimeters, I would be suggesting to go and give those a go. They're really fascinating targets, ones that I can't really do any justice of at this time, but I'll love to see your images of it. So that's my suggestion for 2000 millimeters. Now on to planets for you planet hunters out there. I've got a couple to choose from. Like I said before, at my latitude in the United Kingdom around the Midlands area, about 53 degrees latitude, I think. One of them from mid-July onwards is Saturn. Now it only raises to about 23 degrees altitude and that is, <laughs> it barely makes this list. But Saturn, one of the most iconic planets in our solar system, I know there's eight others to choose from. So with a decent enough instrument and the proper techniques and possibly extremely long focal lengths, you may even be able to get some detail in the Cassini division. Not entirely sure, don't quote me on that one. But Saturn is there and it is a relatively viable target. Of course, if you're at different latitudes, it may be higher, it may be lower. So you might just wanna check something like Stellarium or Telescopius and just make sure that it is high enough because at 23 degrees you're probably still definitely going to need some kind of atmospheric dispersion corrector because there's going to be a lot of gunk in your atmosphere really it's still quite low but otherwise i was quite grasping to find some planets for you now at the end of july if you have extremely long focal lengths a lot of patience and good enough skies and the skill there is neptune now again from my latitude neptune rises to about 35 degrees altitude so it is relatively high but the problem about neptune is you may be aware it's quite far away so those where those folk long focal lengths probably barlow lenses are going to come in you're going to probably need or really want a lot of aperture for this job so neptune is their beautiful blue target nice little jewel in our night sky so if you have the equipment and the skill give it a go now jupiter does make an honorary appearance on this list but because it didn't really rise over 20 degrees altitude which is my personal cutoff i'm not including it this month but we're going to talk about that in a moment now on to notable events on the night of the 15th so by extension the morning of the 16th saturn actually gets quite close to the moon and something like a two to 300 millimeter camera lens would work quite nicely here if you want to get a nice little snap of the moon and saturn together now of course you're not going to really get any resolved detail of saturn you might get some moons doubt it though because this the moon is just our moon luna is going to just completely overexpose 
Saturn, so you might need to do a bit of wizardry there, but they should both fit in that camera frame. Similarly, on the night of the 18th, so by extension, morning of the 19th, the Jupiter, the Jupiter, the <laughs> Jupiter is very close to the moon, to the point where a 300 millimeter camera lens on a full frame body should get a nice image of the two. So if you're out and about and you want to take a quick cheeky snap of the moon with Jupiter, there's your chance. And on the 21st of July, for what is probably the most ultimate formality in this list, the moon actually occludes Mars. However, I've looked and I've checked and I've checked and I've looked again, and I can only ever see it in the Northern Hemisphere. I can only ever see it happening about 9 p.m. during daylight hours and below the horizon. So not really being able to get a photograph of that. So it's like I said, it's a complete formality. This is going to happen. We're going to miss it, unfortunately. Speaking of things we won't miss though, here are some meteor showers. On the 12th of July to about the 23rd of August, peaking at the 30th of July, we have the Delta Aquids meteor shower. And these could reach up to about 25 meteors an hour. The good thing about this as well, aside from the fact it's a meteor shower with an okay rate of meteors, is that the moon isn't going to actually interfere with this meteor shower. So out and about then with some time-lapse photography, wide angle lenses, things like that, maybe try to get some meteors in there. We also have the Persid meteor shower. It begins on the 17th of July, but it actually peaks within August. So I'll go into more detail with it on TNS August, but just mention it now, you know, if you're out and about with a wide angle lens and you don't know what else to do, you might be able to point yourself towards Perseus with some long exposures. You might get some meteors in it there. And now to finish off this list, we're going to go on to the lunar phases now, in case you want to get a nice crescent image of the moon, or you want to know when to use the hydrogen alpha filters, or when you have a nice early night. So, first quarter in July is going to be the 7th of July. The full moon will be the 13th of July, and that is the book moon. Last quarter is the 20th of July, and new moon is the 28th of July. Now, July's full moon, the book moon, can also be referred to as the thunder moon, due to increased thunderstorm activity during July, and it can also be referred to as the hay moon after the July harvest. However, Native Americans refer to it as the book moon because this is when the male deer shed their antlers, ready for them to be regrown. So there, now you know. And with that, the night sky July 2022 is all wrapped up, finished, done. Hope you've enjoyed the list. Hope you found something inspiring, gave you some ideas of what to go out and image. And if I've missed your favorite thing to image in July, be sure to add it to the conversation in the comments down below. And with that, if you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you disliked it, well, you know what that one is. And if you want more videos like this, consider becoming a subscriber. But in the meantime, all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching. Hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.